Live. Hey everyone, we're live on the Modern Web Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jay Phelps, and uh, this podcast is presented by This Dot. So uh, with me, I've got three gentlemen from the Google team who work on V8 full time, and so uh, I want to let them introduce themselves. Uh, Benedict, do you want to go first? Oh, my name is Benedict. I work on V8 for five years now. I was leading the TurboFan effort, and now I'm mostly working on Node.js parts of V8. Hi, I'm Matthias, and I joined the team just last year. And I mostly focus on new language features, so new modern JavaScript features. And uh, I work on standardizing them through TC39, and then I help implement them as well. Uh, hello, I'm Yaro, and I'm, I took over the Benedict's team, uh, the, the TurboFan effort, like a year ago. But I am with the VA team for four years now. Wonderful. So uh, thanks, thanks, guys, for joining. Uh, today, we're going to talk about V8. Um, so that's why we've got the, the experts here. So in case anyone's joining us and they're not entirely sure what it is, that v, what V8 actually is and what it isn't, can you guys talk a little bit about like, what, what is V8? Why, why would I care about V8 in particular rather than something like Chrome? Or you know, where is it used? I can take this one. Uh, V8 is Google's JavaScript engine. Uh, it's being used in Google Chrome but also in other embedders, such as Node.js, for example. So it is very much a standalone engine that can be embedded in multiple different applications, and it has lots of use cases. Um, because it's also used in Electron indirectly, um, it's, it means that it's also used in applications like Atom or Visual Studio Code, for example. Um, another example of an embedder that you may not expect is uh, Google BigQuery. Uh, it is actually possible to run JavaScript code as part of your query in BigQuery. And guess which JavaScript engine executes that JavaScript code? Yes, it's V8. <laughs> um, as, as far as the code base goes, it's implemented in C++. Um, it was initially written for Chrome specifically in Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, but nowadays, the development happens in London, Munich, where we are, and San Francisco and Mountain View. Uh, I should also point out that V8 is not just the JavaScript engine anymore. Uh, we also implement WebAssembly as part of the same V8 project. Uh, it also doesn't just implement JavaScript and the entire language, but also has lots of infrastructure around tooling, uh, such as whenever you use the DevTools, for example, um, they're actually using the APIs that V8 makes available to Chrome, to the DevTools, to hook into that uh, internal functionality. OK, and what is it that you guys in particular work on? Do you guys do work on ever all of that stuff, or do you guys work on very specific parts of it? So I, I personally mostly work on the optimizing compiler, but I dabble in, in other things. So that means optimizing the workloads that, that we see. So we have benchmarks, so that's a big part of, of our story, to, to do well on the benchmarks. But we also try to look at real-world applications and real-world workloads, and we are producing new benchmarks. So th there is lots of staring into generating assembly, generating assembly, mm -hmm. and just figuring out what, what, what is slow there and figure out how to make it faster. But we also work on everything that's uh, that's V8-related. So I, for example, also look at, work on profiling from time to time. So just make sure that uh, that we have two the right tools for profiles and that our profiles are precise. Also, like for Node.js profilers, so that it is Linux perf. Uh, that, that you can use with V8, and I, I, I did the bindings for, for Linux Perf, so it's all kinds of things. I just quickly want to point out that the optimizing compiler in V8, uh, the one that we currently have, is called TurboFan. In case some people have heard this name before, that's what uh, Yado was talking about. And what, what about previously, though? Like, what, what are some, what's, how has V8 evolved over the years? You said that the current optimizing compiler is called TurboFan. Why, is, Assuming that, like, why, why is that given a name, I guess? So it, it was it has been a complete rewrite of the, of the optimizer compile. So the previous compile was called Crankshaft for whatever reason. Uh, <laughs> crankshaft, right? Crankshaft, right? All the V8 parts are named after cars and car parts and stuff. Yeah. Is there, has there ever been a NOS? Anything that is NOS, nitrous oxide? No? <laughs> no, no, we're actually thinking about this. Like, ah, what, what is so, thoughts on this? Yeah, trademark. <laughs> next, the next compiler. Next compiler. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 
we, we wrote it from scratch because there were so there, there were several issues with the crankshaft compiler. So one one was that it was really tricky to add all the modern features to crankshaft. So this was about when the ES6 uh, features were 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 being proposed and like finalized, mm -hmm. and then there were some things that were near, like nearly impossible to pull off in crankshaft. Even actually, even not just ES6, but exception handling was really really tricky, and we didn't know how to make it work with crankshaft. It was one of the one of the big reasons why why we wrote a new compiler that could handle all, all this new stuff. And it was designed from scratch to support all of the language, not 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 so crankshaft supported just subset. So it was basically fast parts, only only the stuff that was deemed to be worth comp optimizing for. Mm. For example, try catch wasn't in that set for whatever reason, <laughs> but many of the ES6 features would fall outside outside of this set. So that's why we wrote a new compiler to support the entire language. So what's the point of having modern JavaScript language features if they're not fast, which means that people won't be using them because they want performance code. Right. And TurboFan, well, the new pipeline with Ignition, our new interpreter, and TurboFan, our new optimizer compiler, fixes that problem. Yeah. But to put this into perspective, just every single for off loop, for example, includes an implicit try finding it. I find the statement. So any function that contains for off would not be optimizable at all. <laughs> the whole function. Or any generator, any async function, any yeah, any destructuring even, any array destructuring already. So any dot 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 a inside yeah. of an array would not be optimizable. The whole function that contains this is not optimizable then. In the old pipeline. In the old In pipeline. pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's wonderful. So t tell me a little bit more about the history of, of V8. So I wasn't there from the start of V8, so I don't know really the beginnings. But what I hear is it, it came from, it was heavily inspired by Smalltalk, for the, uh, by the Smalltalk VM. And uh, so it is, but it, and the original version was written just for. Can I start to interrupt you? But can you can you elaborate a little bit on that? So Smalltalk being a programming language, what do you mean by it, it was? Um, Inspired by that, like it's inspired by. So there is this VM uh, called Self, right? For, for what, what is it? Self. Sorry, I couldn't couldn't hear that. What's it called? Virtual machine called Self. Self. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So there is a special, a specific implementation of Smalltalk called Self, and uh, that so Smalltalk, what it has in common with JavaScript, it has it has this property access. So it has this dyna really dynamic feature yeah. where you not where you have properties that are not known statically where they go. And this is a big, big part of V8 is to make, make this fast, make property access fast. And that's a really hard problem. And so the original version was written in x86. And what it optimized, like actually like the only serious optimization that was going on in there was the property access optimization. It was a very clever trick how to cache property accesses. So if you have property access like O.F, what you want to remember is like where to go for this f inside this object in memory, and it actually cached, so it keep kept track at runtime where these properties live, and then when you do the next access at the same at the same line of the source code, if you hit it next time, you read it already once, it will actually look, use this this cached cached lookup from the previous time, and it will know where to go. So this 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 is called inline cache inline caches. So this is caching of these property accesses. And this was the only optimization that was really going on in there. Otherwise, it was pretty straightforward VM. Yeah? But this, this, this allowed the JavaScript to run actually much, much faster than it used to run before. So uh, V8 was, uh, uh, when you say it was a VM, it, did, did it, it was a JIT? Like it JITed code ahead of time instead of yeah. interpreting it from the very beginning. Interesting. Exactly. So it was for x86, and it had only one JIT. It was like very simple JIT. Just one pass through the source code, like no, almost no optimization except this inline caching mechanism, which was done by code patching. So it was like kind of nasty mechanism in some way, which was which was really well suited for processors back th back then. Mm -hmm. So that was, we actually moved away from from code patching. So we, we do this inline caches differently now, uh, and also it JIT, JIT at that time was much faster than interpreting code. So now, now we are, now we interpret code because modern processors actually do really, really well with interpreted code. But back then, it was much better to JIT. So lots of changes happened. Like the 
but uh, but the, the main idea main ideas remain the same like make property access fast uh, and cache cache the property accesses so there is lots of cleverness in this gathering of type feedback and how to make property accesses fast okay and how do you how do you decide like it seems like a very unintuitive thing that like jit would be very like jit would be the way to go at first but then now later many years later now interpreting is 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 faster how is that how do you guys actually concretely decide that that's the case and that oh funnily enough we didn't really decide so we we thought like let's try so yeah. so part of the team actually sit down sat down and wrote an interpreter in several months or yeah it, it was many many months and optimized it and then we found out okay it's actually about as fast and you save lots of memory by doing that because the right. the jitted codes actually takes Quite a bit of memory, whereas the interpret the white code doesn't take so much memory. So that was the main saving, and the speed was about the same, I guess, like maybe slightly slower. But the optimizing compile can actually make up for any any loss of speed. So we we I think we lost a bit of speed, but the optimizing compile took up took, took this took this loss. So it was it was okay. And so, so, and so the Oh, sorry. sorry but different now because uh, we we have an optimizing compiler, whereas in the beginning, in the initial days. It was just this baseline JIT that we had in V8. So there was no optimizing compiler that the that you could tear up to for hot code. So the mm -hmm. baseline JIT would have to handle all code, even the hot code. Whereas now the interpreter barely handles the startup case and the initial and runs of the function, and that's it. There's so many things that have changed since the V8 project was started, right? I mean, it's almost 10 years old at this point. And I mean, I'm not sure if, as a developer, you can remember what it's like to go 10 years back in time, because it seems like an eternity in software development. But back then, we were still in the ECMAScript 3 days. ES3 was a thing. We didn't even have ES5. That's when V8 was started. Um, and back then, the way we would measure performance was also completely different compared to the way it is now. We had all these uh, micro benchmarks, which tested various payloads that didn't re necessarily reflect the real world. They were just benchmarks that someone put together, and then all browsers started to optimize for these benchmarks. But over the last couple of years, uh, V8 especially has shifted to uh, optimizing for real-world performance, because it's actually much more important that developers writing real code for production websites and applications get nice performance boosts than it is to make a certain specific micro benchmark fast that w when it's synthetic. Um, so we used to have benchmarks like SunSpider and Octane back in the day. Uh, but nowadays, we focus more on things like Speedometer, for example, which is a, a benchmark that we recently updated uh, together with the WebKit team at Apple. Um, Speedometer tests various JavaScript frameworks and libraries that we find developers using and deploying to production websites on the web. Um, so for example, it includes things like React or Preact or Ember or Vue.js. And it tests all these different uh, frameworks and libraries. And we find that uh, when we measure optimizations that we do in V8 or elsewhere in Chrome uh, through this speedometer benchmark that we see this uh, improvement reflected in the real world as well. Uh, and another real world benchmark that uh, Benedict did a lot of work on as well is called the web tooling benchmark. Maybe people have heard of that. Um, it's basically we are trying to bring real world web benchmarks to the Node.js ecosystem. And we noticed that a lot of web tooling is actually built on top of the Node ecosystem. Uh, people using Webpack or Babel or TypeScript, all these things. Um, are also a big part of web development, but they're also being used on Node.js. So by optimizing for these uh, popular tools, we not only cut down on the build time for every developer in the world who runs npm run build, for example, mm -hmm. uh, but we also end up optimizing the actual output for these different tools. The web faster for everyone, basically. So does it, so go, so Google actually uh, Google actually uh, uh, like a. Uh, Officially provides support for V8 being used in Node. Like you guys actually like that's something you guys actually physically uh, pay attention to and make sure works and and stuff like that. It's not because it didn't it used to, V8. I, my understanding was it, it's traditionally just like it was open source, but Google mostly just obviously focused, rightfully so, on just Chrome. So it's a very it seems like a very recent thing that you guys have been doubling down on focusing on on V8 or uh, on uh, you know like the Node usage and, and stuff like that. Is that is that an accurate picture? Yes, that, that so that changed uh, almost two years back when we started making uh, integrating Node into our continuous integration system, so that uh, every commit that goes into V8 
now has to pass the node test tweak as well, in addition to uh, all of the V8 and some Chrome tests. Oh, they wow. cannot land anything in V8 that would break node. And this already caught a lot of issues that would have blown up on node later. So node awesome. is now a first class citizen, just like Chrome is for the V8 project. Cool. And with the web tooling benchmark, we also express our intent to, uh, to, to optimize the performance um, on the node side. So node is not just server side code. It's also basically what builds the web nowadays. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see a lot of different patterns for like, it seems like there'd be, a, a, be different patterns of code optimization requirements for like no, for node usage versus like a browser usage. Like, you know, the, the type of things that, that it's actually doing in computing. Is that, is that, that that's my intu intuition. Is that uh, accurate? There are actually selfish, somewhat selfish reasons in, for Chrome to support it or for V8 to support, support Node. And that is because like, we always have this chicken and egg problem by introducing new, new language features, right? Because like, nobody's using them, so how do we optimize them if we don't see any patterns, like how the new language features are used? And in the browser world, the life cycle is really, really long because people transpile away all the new features. So we actually don't see any new features like inside the browser world. And so Node is good for us, even like e even if we didn't do any Node inside Google, which which we do. But even if we didn't do any Node inside Google, it's good because there the pickup is much faster of new features than 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 in the browser line. So yeah. that 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 part is good uh, on, on the Node side and contributes a lot to V8. So it's good for V8 to support Node, even for this selfish reason that we can get we can get some use cases. We can see how you, how people use. ES6 or, or any, any new features in JavaScript, we can optimize for them much, much sooner than they hit the web. Uh, so that's, that part is good. And, but there are differences in these cases. And nobody, Benedict, might want to elaborate on that. Yeah, so, so, right. So I've, I've been staring a lot at Node code and also talking to uh, people who write big Node applications and to support Node applications in the wild. Um, and one of the things that stands out on that side is that asynchronous processing in Node is the main, just the main thing why people use Node on the server side. So more or less building microservices that just uh, talk to different backend services. Uh, and what they care about the most is that you free the main loop. So you get back as soon as possible to the main loop because there's nothing worse than blocking the main loop for long. And this means that this is also interesting for Chrome, but in Chrome you would notice this by uh, having jank while scrolling on a page, for example. And this is, you block one user, whereas if you do this on a server side, then all of a sudden you can block 10,000s of users in the worst case, and the, the problem piles up. <laughs> but it's really bad uh, if you don't get this right. And there's another thing, uh, what we see is there's a move towards async await uh, versus the old style um, callback asynchronous programming model. And async await is really uh, take some effort to get as fast uh, as the callback model. So that's one area that we are currently working on. So we have made some pretty significant improvements already. Um, and we hope to make more, even make it even better. So Node 10 is already way better than Node 8, or will be way better once it's released. And we hope to get even more performance out of this for Node 12. You make a really good point, Jay, in that there's a very big difference between what people do on the web with JavaScript versus what they do in Node.js. I mean, even in Node.js itself, there's so many different ways you can use JavaScript. But if you take the classical example of writing a Node.js mm -hmm. server, for example, then usually you have some code that you run once when you start up the server. But then there is this basically infinite loop that keeps, it's, it's an application that keeps running and that keeps executing JavaScript as new requests come in. It is a completely different scenario compared to a, a basic website where you have some JavaScript that runs on startup that you basically execute once. And then as the user interacts with the page, sure, some other code might be executed or maybe you load some other code dynamically. Uh, but it's a completely different thing uh, for a website to run than it is for a server to run for weeks on end and to mm -hmm. keep running the same as same code in potentially hot loops. So the problem and the challenge for V8 is to support all these different use cases and ideally to be fast for all of them or as many of them as possible. Yep, that makes sense. 
So one thing that's dear to my heart and my passion is WebAssembly. And so I wanted to hear you guys talk a little bit about like what it's been like to integrate WebAssembly into V8, um, what kind of, you know, what's the latest status on performance in WebAssembly and stuff like that. None of us really works directly on WebAssembly, but we, we saw the history. So actually TurboFan was originally designed to to support ASM.js because Crankshaft didn't really do well with, uh, on ASM.js code, so that was like a different aspect of that because Crankshaft was really based on the JavaScript paradigm where you where you optimize code based on the type feedback. Based on what you see in the past, you, op you generate optimized code. But uh, ASM.js was already falling off this because... It, and, and just, sorry to interrupt, but just to clarify for people who don't know, uh, ASM, ASM.js, also known as ASM.js, it's, it was a precursor to WebAssembly that was basically kind of, it's a strict subset of JavaScript that can be typed and so that the, the browsers can do some extra optimizations around. And it was led, led by Mozilla in, in partnership with you guys, I know. Um, but uh, anyway, continue. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew what we were talking about. Oh, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so TurboFan, uh, TurboFan was was one way to was to was designed also to improve performance on ASMJS because uh, if Crankshaft couldn't make use of these static types that were that were encoded in ASMJS. Um, and so, so I saw these early days where TurboFan was made. You know, Superfan was executing code that was very similar to us. Uh, but then it like then it gradually split off. So originally ASMJS was sort of sharing the sharing the heap with uh, with JavaScript, and this is this is slowly splitting off from it's divorcing from JavaScript execution model. So we see uh, we see less and less of commonality between JavaScript and, and Wasm. So because also because of threads, so Wasm Wasm will get threads uh, soon. And then the JavaScript, was, JavaScript engine was never designed to really do threads and share memory and multi-threading. So that's, uh, that's also one part where we need to do something because we have this JavaScript feed that's just one thread only and the code lives there. And we have to split it off so that the code can be shared by several, by several modules. So this is one awesome improvement that, that wasn't the offer because now if you want to use multi-threading with JavaScript, you have to do web workers and web workers mean like the, the, they are really independent instances of the of the JavaScript engine with web, work, web, web workers. So, so we we need to compile every code like several times. If you use the same code in multiple threads, this will be this this will be actually different instances of the code. The optimizing compile will have to on each of them it will have to optimize the same functions even though they are the same. Whereas with uh, with WebAssembly, there is the hope that we will share or we will share the same the code. And we will optimize it just once, and we will run from one instance of code. So that's like one big, big difference from JavaScript, which is not shipping yet, but we will. Yeah, this is this is now being, being developed. Yeah, I just want to clarify: it's still a best practice to offload uh, work that could happen off the main thread to offload that to a worker. And in fact, I think it's fairly common to execute like uh, one script in a worker and not repeat it or spawn it off into multiple workers that run the same code. So in that case, it's still a best practice. So um, there's one feature that I think is killer about WebAssembly and doesn't get talked about enough is the streaming compilation. So the ability, the, the idea is the ability to parse and compile the WebAssembly code while it's still being downloaded. Instead of like the more traditional model where you have to wait in for the entire file to finish downloading and then compile it. And so in a lot of cases, like was like Firefox, for example, they 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 do support the streaming compilation, and and in most platform on most computers with internet combinations, they can compile the code faster than it can actually download. And so by the time you've downloaded the bytes, they're already ready and compiled. Um, has has V8 made progress on on the streaming compilation side of things? Yep, I think one or two V8 versions ago, we actually shipped support for you know, the compiling. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's super nice. Uh, we actually already supported the API previously, except behind the scenes, it wasn't actually doing streaming compilation. Yeah. Uh, the reason we did that is because we wanted developers to be able to use the API already in Firefox and Chrome without having to worry about compatibility differences. Because uh, you can think of what goes on behind the scenes as a performance optimization. As a developer, you don't really notice whether it's really streaming or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, now that we actually implemented the streaming parts, things are much faster. 
And indeed, by the time the bytes have downloaded, I mean, the compiler's almost finished, like a couple of microseconds later. Wonderful. And we actually recommend this pattern uh, whenever you're loading a WebAssembly module. Uh, actually, recently published a blog post with uh, what we think is the best practice for loading WebAssembly modules. And it is indeed using uh, streaming compilation. The one interesting uh, thing to note here, by the way, is that with Ignition, you also get this for JavaScript under the hood. So we also parse while we download. And we did this for quite a while already, at least for 10 releases. And with Ignition recently, we also started compiling while you download. So it, it's, I think somewhat related to that is, uh, you know, I've heard for many years that, that V8 will try not to do too much work on function bodies that it detects don't get called immediately, right? And can you elaborate on how that actually works? Like, I, I assume you have to still parse the body because how else would you know that the body ends and like, you know what I'm saying? Like you have to find the start and end of the function. So you have to parse it, right? So what, what gets skipped? Is it creating the, like do you still, you create the AST, like the, the actual nodes, and then do you still create the, oh, you don't even do that. No. How do you? There's actually two parsers, or like it's it's one code base, but uh, but we generate two parsers basically. And one parser does uh, is is for this really really fast parsing when you just need to find out like, where the function is, what are the variables that are captured by closures, like the necessary information, but only the necessary information. And AST is not the necessary information, so yeah. that that doesn't even generate the AST. So there is this fast parser that parses, I think, twice as fast as the as the normal parser. And only that, like when you download code, only that runs. So wow. There it is. OK. Wow. Well, with Ignition, now we also compile or we download some functions, not all of them. Sorry, can you say that again, Benedict? Uh, with Ignition, we also have the ability now to also compile functions ahead of time, essentially. On off thread, so not blocking the main thread. So, in the sense of like, even though a function doesn't get called immediately, like on window load or whatever. Um, well, we know for some that functions that are, that they will be called, like uh, iffy functions, for example. We know that they will be called there on top level. Okay. Very nice. And uh, let's see here. Anything else we wanted, you guys wanted to talk about on WebAssembly? I know there was the uh, the the announcement of the the Qt beta. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you pointed us out yesterday. Yes, yes, I just discovered this yesterday. It was yeah. released yesterday. <laughs> a lot of the demos are broken, but it's still cool. At least they were broken for me. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not really smooth yet, but I, I, I guess it will be when time comes. So I think having Qt or having all these general purpose. Can you talk a little bit about Qt, just real quick? Uh, Qt is a, a toolkit for um, C++. So it's cross-platform. It supports Mac, Windows, and Linux, or the various flavors of Unix, I guess. At least that was back in the days. And it's also being used for mobile app development. So you can use this to uh, write iOS applications and Android applications and um, Windows phone applications, if that's still a thing. And um, recently, with the latest version, they also announced that they can now compile down to WebAssembly, which means you can also deploy your or deploy the code that you would use in your desktop application on the web directly. So you would probably frame it a bit differently so it doesn't get this native frame that you get on Windows, but, um, some changes for the web. But essentially, you could just use exactly the same code base that you use for your heavy desktop application and just ship it on the web by using Qt. Yeah, that's actually one of the cool use cases about WebAssembly that you can have this existing code base lying around in C, C++, or maybe Rust if it's a more modern code base. And you can just compile it to WebAssembly nowadays using existing tooling, and then ship your application to the web as well as to the platforms that you're already shipping on. And there was an interesting example of a game, uh, I think Funky Carts or something is the yep, name? Yeah, Funky Carts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the developer of that game did an awesome write-up about how he did everything. But basically, he had this code base of this game lying around. It's a native mobile game for Android and iOS. And what he ended up doing is taking that same code base, creating a demo version of the game, and then deploying that to the web using WebAssembly. So that way, he got all the benefits of using the web, meaning he can just send a link to anyone. Uh, it's very easy to share this game now. People can try out the demo. If they like it, they can decide to buy the game on their mobile phone of choice. 
so I thought this was a pretty clever new use case that WebAssembly actually unlocks. And well, you could argue that the same thing might have been possible using ASM.js or other tools from the past. Uh, but I don't think that's really true because the performance of ASM.js is not as good as WebAssembly can be. Mm -hmm. And of course, for a game, having buttery smooth 60 FPS animation is, is key. Like if the game doesn't run smoothly on your machine, even if it's the demo version that you're playing on the web, people may not want to buy the official full version. Uh, so in a way, WebAssembly made this new use case possible. So what, do you, what is your guys' take on WebAssembly getting closer to the metal in the sense of like, do you think WebAssembly is going to be used by operating systems ever? Like actually as part of like, will I be able to ship my WebAssembly app and run it on, on Android without, like outside of the browser? Like, do you think that this is gonna be a, a, a way for us to, to bridge the gap between browser and, and operating system, you know, the Chrome OS style stuff? I mean, obviously, there's the, the the binary, the bytecode itself is is one only one part of it. There's the actual APIs, right? Which is like one of the big problems, right? You know, there is no the DOM is the closest thing we have to a standardized um, API for cross platform. Um, but there still seems like there'd be a lot of benefits to the operating systems because all, all these operating systems, Android, iOS, and all them, they they invent their own model of of process isolation and and you know memory safety and stuff like that. But WebAssembly gives you all of that for free in a standardized fashion. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's not about the bytecode so much as it's more. It's really more about the APIs and the ecosystem and all of this. Because um, so WebAssembly in that in that sense it's not new because we had JVM bytecode for ages and it, it didn't fly that in the same sense that you're expressing your hope for WebAssembly now. So right, but JVM yeah. not just the bytecode that you need. You need more than this. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, I also think it's still early days for WebAssembly in a way, and uh, there's I mean there's a lot of use cases that people can bring up already. I also believe that there will be use cases that people just haven't thought of yet with WebAssembly. And that over the next couple of years, as the, the tooling landscape improves, as the support for WebAssembly in general approve, improves as well, I think we will start to see more and more new use cases that we haven't even considered yet. Yeah, very cool. Uh, anything else before we move on, on WebAssembly? Yeah, I, I speak at a lot of conferences and I go to a lot of meetups, like local meetups and meetups all around the world. And uh, very often, people come up and ask me, so uh, in a couple of years, will you be out of a job because WebAssembly is going to replace JavaScript? Mm -hmm. and, well, first off, I work on the V8 team, and V8 also implements WebAssembly. So I guess maybe I would still have a job in this class. Uh, but I think the premise of that question is flawed. Like WebAssembly is not here to replace JavaScript. Uh, in fact, I think they go hand in hand. They each have different use cases. WebAssembly can bring your existing code base that you have laying around to the web, which opens up a new market for you, potentially. Uh, it can also offer performance improvements compared to what we used to have before, which is ASM.js and similar solutions. Um, but it, it just has a completely different use case than JavaScript. And I think WebAssembly and JavaScript work best when combined together. There are two separate orthogonal solutions to completely different problems. So I don't think one is going to replace the other. Yeah, okay. at, this, yeah. at the moment, uh, WebAssembly is, is not a great fit for dynamic languages. That might change in the future, but this is lots of hard work that will have to be done, and it hasn't been done yet. So there is lots of things that you might want to do from WebAssembly, but you are still not able to, like um, garbage collection. That, for example, is, is, is very hard to get, to get fast on WebAssembly right now. Uh, you would need to, pro for efficient garbage collection like the one you have in V8, you would really need specific support. So that's it's similar to, to, to the landscape that you have in LLVM, which is the compiler framework for C++. And there also, it's really hard, it's, it's really hard to get garbage collection support, right? So that, it, it's possible it will happen, but still, this hasn't been done yet. Or, already multi-threading is, is quite hard to get right, and we, but this, this will come soon. And Lots of very smart people are working on this. It's still early days, so. I don't think it's fair to expect all of these things out of the box yet. Uh, people are working on it, and we'll see improvements in the future. Yeah, and hopefully we see the ecosystem and the developer experience 
getting to the same point at least where JavaScript is nowadays, and then we see where to go from there. Yeah. I mean, even in terms of JavaScript, it's clear to see that things take a lot of time. Even when you think about uh, language features, for example, let's talk about modules for a second here. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, ECMAScript modules, it, the syntax was specified in ES 2015, which happened a couple of years ago already. But only recently, we started to actually see support for this in browsers. And when it comes to Node, we're still working out the details. There is an experimental implementation for modules in Node. Uh, you have to run it with a flag, and it only works for MJS files with that extension. Uh, and we're still working out the interoperability. <laughs> you're, not a, you're not a fan of MJS. I'm right? not a fan of MJS. No. Well, I do think developers need some way of differentiating between regular scripts and modules, because they're interpreted in a different way. Like modules use uh, are in strict mode by default, for example. So you could have the same piece of JavaScript code that behaves completely differently when it's run as a script versus as a module. And right. there needs to be some way to make this distinction. Uh, and in the browser, of course, we have script, script type equals module, which is the hint to the browser that this is, in fact, a module. But on Node, we don't have anything like that. We just want to be able to import something or to run an entry file. And somehow, Node needs to know that this is actually a module. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think an extension is not the worst solution. In fact, it, I think it might be the best, but yeah, I know it's yeah. a very yeah. It's a very it's a very heated thing and something I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I don't. I've I've tried to stay out of the debate because it's, it's not coincidence that this is MJS because it stands for Matthias JavaScript. That's exactly right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I see what's going on. <laughs> so let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about, we've talked actually quite a bit about this at the beginning, um, but can you guys step through exactly what happens when, let's say I'm downloading some JavaScript into V8 and it, it, it gets run? So like goes through Ignition, Turbofan, like can you guys step through so everyone understands how does that actually happen? Like what happens? Yeah, I can take that. So it all starts with your JavaScript code that you write. So let's assume you just have a simple script and we take that script and essentially run it through the pre-parser, which finds all the functions inside, but doesn't compile the functions yet. So it just knows, OK, there's function foo at line 70, character 3, and so on. So then you have a version, a view of the script. And then we start running the top level code, which is the code that is not wrapped in a function. We compile this into bytecode. And the bytecode starts running in the interpreter. So bytecode is a um, compact representation of um, the abstract operations that the JavaScript VM needs to execute. So the bytecode consists of things like add this to this and put the result here, or load field x from object o. Yeah, so Francisca actually has a blog post explaining like the basics of the bytecode that we're using V8. Right. Uh, so I recommend Googling for her blog post on Medium about that if you're interested. Just Google for V8 bytecode. I think that yeah. yields her blog post. OK, so then we, we start running your bytecode. And eventually, we'll probably run other functions as well. So we turn those functions into bytecode as well and start executing them. And eventually, one of these functions might become hot, which means it's either called a certain number of times, or um, there's a loop inside that has run for a certain number of times. So the exact heuristic is not set in stone, and it usually changes depending on um, what we need, what we find useful, or what we find works best. Uh, but anyway, so once the function becomes hot, we uh, uh, enqueue it for recompilation with the optimizing compiler, which is Tofan in our case. And while we were interpreting the function, we also collected information about the types and the shapes of objects that we have seen inside of the function. And TurboFan takes this information plus the bytecode to generate the minimum, minimal optimal code for uh, these functions according to what we have seen in the past. So we're basically so making assumptions. About we make optimistic assumptions that whatever we saw in the past will also be what we see in the future, which means we need to be able to handle the case where these assumptions fail. And that's what we call de-optimization. So this is the optimization is the fundamental technique that you need to make speculative optimizations work or to make them viable. Uh, and that means Tofan, whenever Tofan sees something that it cannot handle because it was assuming that this will not happen, it just goes back to the interpreter. So it at, at each each of these points, 
we basically uh, remember a full snapshot of how the interpreter um, would look at this point. And in case we fail one of these assumptions, we restore the interpreter state and continue from there. And then the function could turn hot again in the future, and we might optimize based on new assumptions. When I joined the team, I remember thinking, ooh, the optimizing, that sounds really bad. It sounds like a bad thing. But it's actually the main vital feature of VA that makes sure that we can run code without uh, being incorrect or without violating the spec. So it's actually a great, important feature. And, and uh, is there ever cases where something gets stuck in, in like a loop of going back and forth between optimize and de-optimize and just keeps? Yes, that's what we call a de loop, and that's pretty bad because uh, that means you don't make, the, uh, you think of this uh, profiling information that you collect, or we, we uh, use the term feedback for this. So uh, we think of it as a lattice in which you need to make progress at each time, every time um, that you de-opt, the interpreter has to make progress in this letter, so it has to learn something new. Otherwise, we might just optimize with the same assumptions again, and then there's the loop. Mm -hmm. So um, crankshaft, this was really terrible in the crankshaft days, <laughs> because crankshaft um, was not really designed to pay a lot of attention to this. Uh, crankshaft would also deopt in cases where the interpreter or where the baseline JIT back then couldn't learn anything new. And with TurboFan, we try to make sure that we always learn something new when we deop. And I think by now we don't have any known deop loops anymore. That doesn't mean there couldn't be a bug. Still, <laughs> no, no known one. issues. Yeah. If you find one, file a bug, yeah. yeah. So this, this is a bug now. So it used, yes. to, it used not to be a bug. It used to be this is uncommon scenario. Mm -hmm. so that was how we called it those days. These days, it's a bug, and it will be fixed if we find it. That's, that's really great to know. I'm glad I asked about that then. Yeah, because I, I ran into that years ago. I haven't, I haven't run into it recently, but but years ago, I was doing some profiling of Ember, and I actually ran into that. Um, Ember itself, like the framework itself. Oh, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, but we, had, we used to have a guard for this as well. So we just had 10 attempts to optimize the function. And if we uh, de-opted for the 11th time, then all bets were off, and this function would never be optimized again. Ah. Why was 10 the magic number? Uh, because 10 is, is a good number. Oh, that's yeah. a good number, yeah. yeah. So, but, but this had really interesting consequences that we didn't think about back then. And we only learned later, because when, when you look at the web, that doesn't really matter, because eventually you just reload the page, or you close the tab, and whatever, and you navigate to a new tab, uh, sorry, a new page. Mm -hmm. And everything starts from the beginning. But what we discovered then was that node servers that run for days we're actually only running a baseline JIT after some time because of these um, <laughs> uncommon scenarios that turn out to be common, common after a long enough timeline. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Wow. Huh. Uh, so, with, with that, that's a, it was a great rundown. Thank you. With that in mind, how do I then write optimized code, like code that works best? For V8, and I emphasize, I, I emphasize that because basically, like, uh, my worst nightmare was like RxJS version five when um, Ben Lash did most of the rewrite, but I helped on it when I worked at Netflix. And, you know, I remember just lots of lots of long meetings where, like, we would just basically just went through and micro benchmarked things and made like just, just convoluted mess of code just so that it would be really fast in V8 because we cared a lot about the node performance at that point. And, uh, you know, like we avoiding closures and stuff like that at all costs and, you know, using prototype inheritance for everything to make, you know, so that there'd be like a, a, a classing, uh, a, a, a C class backing, a C++ class backing it or whatever. Um, we just did a lot of convoluted things. And then since Ignition and TurboFan, um, I'm kind of answering the question, unfortunately, but it, we, you know, we completely had to go away from, like the, the old patterns actually are no longer perf more performant. Like in fact, just doing normal idiomatic JavaScript was just performant, like using closures and stuff like that. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about that? Like what changed, well, I mean, besides just rewriting, cause that's an obvious, you know, you guys rewrote everything. Fundamentally, what, what, are, what changed in your approach to, to make that possible? This, go to, this goes back to our focus on real-world performance. Uh, yeah. So at some point, the team realized that we shouldn't focus on synthetic micro-benchmarks as much as we did in the past. 
we should probably care more about real-world performance and how the optimizations that we apply to the Git code base, how they actually um, result in real improvements for production code that people actually write. Um, and nowadays, our advice is just what you say. You can just write modern idiomatic JavaScript nowadays. So th there are several differences there compared to the old ES5 crankshaft base, for example. Uh, it means that once a new feature becomes available, a new JavaScript language feature, people should not be afraid to use it because even the baseline performance is already pretty good. It's pretty fast. It's probably equivalent to a handwritten alternative or like the code that you would get when you transpile it. Uh, of course, this is a generic statement. Uh, there's probably exceptions here and there. But in general, you can assume that it, it matches baseline performance of a handwritten equivalent. And in many cases, uh, it will actually be faster than rolling your own alternative uh, because these new native modern language features often offer more optimization potential. Because when you use them, you end up expressing uh, intent rather than implementation. And by doing so, you also give the JavaScript engine more information and you can make, yeah, there's more potential for optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like classes, for example, like they used to perform worse if you actually use the class keyword versus using the transpiled version. Is that not the case anymore? Does the class keyword perform better? Not better, but equally good. Equally? Yeah. OK. So there are some cases where classes might be faster. Um, but yeah, don't rely on this. Just use class whenever it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you want a class, put a class there. If you want a function, put a function there. Like that's the main thing. Like, just write code that makes sense to you, and that way you don't only optimize for any one specific engine, which I think people should not be doing, especially if you write code for the web where you want to support all browsers equally. Uh, that way your code is scalable and works across all browsers, and all JavaScript engines can do the same thing that we're doing and just make it fast by default. So by doing less work, you end up making your code faster across the board, basically. Mm -hmm. There's only also uh, one additional thing to note here that changed in V8 over the years, which is our focus on built-ins. So library functions provided by the, the JavaScript engine that are part of the specifications, and like all these functions on the array prototype, uh, the functions on the object prototype, and the new ones like the map and set collection types, and so on. But traditionally, we didn't, or the, the A team initially didn't focus that much on the build-ins. They were rather something that we had to implement as well. But we mostly uh, looked, or the team back then mostly looked into things like, for example, um, object property access performance. And this was one of the important changes that we now focus a lot on the performance of build-ins so that you can use for, for example, array prototype map and expect this to be as fast as a handwritten loop. In fact, it's most of the time even faster than the handwritten book. Is it really these days? Wow. Yes, it is. Wow. It's always possible to construct a micro benchmark that yeah. does the opposite. But for real world code, we find that it's in most cases faster. Wow. And I, I personally remember the dates when people were actually, myself included, were avoiding array for each, for example, and instead writing handwritten loops because it was faster. And at the time, that was true. But times have changed. And as a developer, that's just great because we can use all these new modern language features and we don't have to worry about performance as much because the engine worries about it for us. It's it's so ingrained in me, unfortunately. Like I I, I don't use for each. I haven't in a long time because it is so ingrained in me that it doesn't perform well. <laughs> or you can also use for off instead of for each. So. Yeah, that's true. And that performed really poorly the, the, the time I, I measured that a lot. Like, I don't know, it was, it was years ago, like year or two at least. You were probably running in the baseline just because Springshift saw a try catch statement. Mm -hmm. It more off, but yeah, yeah it, it was like, oh, damn it, that requires try catch, so I cannot continue. Sorry. Yeah, it's 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 so exciting that we're in that new world now. You guys are obviously on the V8. You guys do V8 and, and Chrome, but do you guys know is is this is this a trend we're seeing across the industry? Like that, like Firefox and and uh, Microsoft Edge and those shouldn't require micro um, you know like adjustments to your code like do you think do, do is the entire um, browser space are all of the all of the browsers doing the exact same thing or in the sense of optimizing around actual use cases rather than micro benchmarks so I can speak to that from the note sites um, we we have been talking a lot to on the Microsoft people 
So there's not just V8 in Node. You can also run Node Chakra Core if you want. So that runs Node based on the Chakra Core engine. And Chakra Core is the, the JavaScript engine of, that runs Edge. Right. Microsoft yeah. Edge there. Yeah. Uh, that's the core part of the engine that sets in uh, Edge, right? So, um, and they had a lot, they had a lot of fun with the um, way that most of the code in Node Core was written because it was essentially not written in idiomatic JavaScript. But instead, it was this thing that we called crankshaft script in the end. <laughs> the term, but uh, yeah, yeah, like just basically probably the code that still that you would write now, as you said, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, avoiding closures and not using for each and whatnot. So um, they they had to basically support parts of our crankshaft. Compile optimizations to uh, also make Node Core fast with their VM. So, and so we joined forces on trying to um, bring developers to the point where they don't write these micro optimized code anymore, but just idiomatic JavaScript. Yeah. So that that goes hand in hand, at least on the Node side. So don't don't try to optimize for any engine. Right. There is actually some follow up advice that we haven't explicitly mentioned yet. Uh, this. Because you can use these modern language features and because you can use idiomatic JavaScript code nowadays, it also means that people should try to avoid over transpiling. Like, we get it, transpiling is important. And especially if you deploy for web browsers, you need broad support of your application. You don't just want it to work in a single browser. Uh, so, transpilation helps with that. Uh, but it's very important that you transpile selectively. And nowadays, that is easier than ever before. You can use something like Babel preset M where you can just tell it the list of browsers and versions that you would like to support. It will automatically figure out for you what the list of supported JavaScript engines is for each of those browsers. And then it will only transpile what it still needs to transpile for those engines, which means you ship smaller bundles of JavaScript, meaning your code will load more quickly. There will be, it will be, it will be faster to parse and compile it. And it will actually have better runtime performance as well. So I've always, although I use it, I have always felt this thing in the back of my head that like not, tough to trust that type of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause that to me, it's like, there's a hard coded list somewhere and I'm trusting it <laughs> that it like, that like, and I just like, I, is that unfound, is that an unfounded fear? I don't know. I just, I feel like just lots of, anytime I made hard coded lists of browsers support this, that like it usually I was wrong. Right. I mean, that's a fair concern, but you could say the same thing every time you add a new dependency to your project, sure. for example. Do sure. you really trust the dependency? Have you inspected all the dependencies of the dependency? Yeah. A absolutely. You are trust and if they say, oh, we support IE8, you're trusting that they really do support IE8, unless they have a test that proves that that's the case, which right. not all of them do. Which actually is a good question. How, how do, what's the recommended way to do like micro benchmarks or any kind of benchmarks for, for my code these days? Like, don't, you don't. don't do any kind of don't do any kind of performance testings. How do I test? Because here's the thing: from a library, as a library, I get that from an app perspective to a certain extent, like you testing A versus B of the exact same thing. But from a library author's perspective, like making a library that people are going to use, it's nice to do these type of tests because obviously we want to have the best performance, and in sometimes in very micro cases, because we can't predict how someone's going to use our library. Some people, like a majority of people, the micro benchmark would be pointless. Uh, and I mean, like even tweaking, like shaving off a couple milliseconds of, of a function call is usually not going to matter for most people in, in using RxJS. But in some cases, it can matter, yeah, um, depending on how they use it. And then the other more, I think more importantly, I think is, is major regressions. Like we're, we're interested in, in finding out and making sure that some big refactor didn't like tremendously decrease the performance or something like that. Um, do you guys still disagree with that? Or do you guys have an alternative approach? I do disagree, yes. <laughs> uh, from my experience of answering these questions multiple times per day via different channels. So the thing is that whenever someone tries to micro benchmark something, then this person ends up benchmarking the wrong thing without because if you don't know all the internals of the VM, then you're very likely not hitting the same path through the VM that you hit when you actually observe the regression in a bigger in a different context. 
and it's super difficult even even if you understand how to so, so i i actually understand that but can you clarify that just for some people like why would it be different like if you run a co run a piece of code you know thousands of times and then run it again in a different way and you get do and you get uh, one is better than the other why in the real world is that not so one of my favorites here is that the uh, people forget to use the result of the computation, and then when the optimizing compiler kicks in and it sees, oh, this is unused code, bam. So what you're measuring is not the, the so then you see, oh, you have 80 billion operations per second, and then, yeah, OK, you're measuring the empty loop here. <laughs> Another example would be, let's say a popular library is Lodash, right? So let's say you're benchmarking Lodash each, which is like the for each alternative. Uh, you can write a benchmark that passes a certain like an array with certain types of values in there and then you can optimize for that case specifically but when people use this in production code they might do s different things than what you're actually benchmarking so if i pass an array with different types of values in v8 behind the scenes that will have that array will have a different elements kind which is what we call it internally uh, you can google it if you're interested in a blog post or even a presentation about this topic i think it's really interesting uh, but yeah basically we perform different optimizations on these arrays based on what kind of types they contain. And it also goes back to what Benedict talked about before. If you, if you pass objects of different shapes to the same library function, then we can de-optimize, we can go polymorphic, all kinds of things can happen. And it's very easy to capture, it, well, it's very hard to capture all these different real-world scenarios into a single micro benchmark. So you're measuring something, but you don't know but it's the right thing. Just mm. take the example of one of these Lodash functions. I don't know Lodash uh, underscore for each, for example. So you now micro. So you saw that this was slow in your app when you were traversing a big array. Okay, but now uh, you're measuring this independently, and you figure out oh, okay, it, it isn't even that slow. <laughs> but it, if you use it inside your app, it is slow. So what is the reason for that? Okay, the reason is easy because you're not the only user of for each. So this single function for each is used in 20 different places and on arrays, on typed arrays, on regular objects, on arguments objects, on whatever. So the type feedback inside of the for each function that the engine collects inside of for each is polluted because uh, it has been used in so many different places on so many different objects. And the micro benchmark doesn't capture that. So, so what, how would I test? Like a library like RxJS, like how would I keep track of what you know improvements or regressions in performance, those type of things? Because well, it's something you want to do, right? I think I think it's a reasonable thing to 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 want to do that. You guys do that, obviously. You guys track performance regressions and stuff like that. I think a proper suite of micro benchmarks is still not a bad thing, but you shouldn't use that to as your only driver for performance work. So mm -hmm. specifically to cap capture the regressions, that's a very good thing to have such a test suite. Mm -hmm. and that's apparently what we have. So we run, we also still run uh, Octane, RS6, the web tooling benchmarks, speedometer, and a couple of other benchmarks on each individual commit just to see whether we regress somewhere. Mm -hmm. I guess the benchmark just should not become the goal in itself, because then you're optimizing for the benchmark, and that does not necessarily reflect the real world. Right. You definitely also want to have some, some approximation of the real world scenario where even if you are writing a library, you probably have something in mind how it will go, how, how it, it's going to be used. And that's probably something that you definitely want to have on your benchmark suite where you have something that's close to real world scenario and measure that. And mm -hmm. that's useful. Micro benchmarks are extremely tricky. Even for us, they are extremely tricky. The way I do it personally very often. I write a bunch of micro benchmark, and I make sure in optimized code, actually, I look at the assembly, and I make sure that the compile didn't do something that I didn't expect, like optimize it away. Mm -hmm. For example, there is this six-speed benchmark that we are optimizing for for a while. So this is a benchmark that, uh, that tries to measure uh, ES6 performance. But I think like 20, maybe 20% 20 of these benchmarks are actually empty loops. They are They basically measure how how well the compiler does that code elimination? So they execute. So if you don't execute, if you don't compile it to empty loop, the performance will be slow. So we have to basically it's about fig compile figuring out that that code, and mm -hmm. that's definitely what you wanted to measure when you wanted to me when you measure ES6 performance. Right. It's hmm. very hard to do micro benchmarks, right? Yeah. 
And there's one other problem. There's a really strong confirmation bias. So if you see the expected result, then usually you don't check really closely. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're, we're getting close to the end here. Is there anything else you guys wanted to talk about or touch on specifically that you wanted to get in? I, I guess I, I just want the world to know that people can write modern idiomatic JavaScript nowadays. Uh, let the JavaScript engine worry about making it fast for you. And if you run into a performance cliff, if you see something weird and suddenly your code gets slow, let us know and we'll look into it. So there is the, the because of the whole, uh, I'm forgetting the names of them, Meltdown and Spectre, right? Because of that, there were a bunch of changes that had to be temporarily um, done, like re performance now had its resolution reduced, um, shared array buffer was removed in some browsers. I don't know if it was removed in, in Chrome. Um, I, performance now was the, the resolution that was changed in, in, in V8, right? Like that was um, reduced. Is, 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 have you guys gone back to increasing the resolution of that or is it still, oh, you still haven't, okay. A performance now is actually implemented outside of V8. It's not part of JavaScript as a language. It's part of the, the, like the DOM layer. Okay. Uh, it's implemented in Blink and Chromium. Uh, but yeah, we, we nerfed some timers and we had to disable shared array buffer temporarily. Uh, but the, the plan is to bring it back at some point. Uh, Do you guys know anything about that as far as like what the timeline or the proposed solutions are? Nothing. Yeah. There is no That's... such plans yet. Yeah. Oh, no, no plans. Okay. Well, no announcements yet. Yeah. yeah. We're hoping to bring it back as soon as possible because people actually have use cases for this. Mm -hmm. uh, Cool. What? Uh, so we don't have a ton of time, but I just I want to talk a little bit about some of the new features that are coming to the platform and JavaScript in general, and and give you guys an opportunity to talk about those things. Like, um, there's the um, Big Int uh, proposal. Um, there's yeah, the actually, generator. Yeah, blog post on Big Int coming up just next week. So you heard it here first. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very nice. Anything, uh, any features that you guys look forward to that you guys have been implementing? Like you're like, I'm really excited for this to, for people to be able to use this thing. Async iteration. Async iterators, yeah. Async iterators yeah. and generators. That's yeah. going to be awesome in Node. Yeah, in fact, Node 10 was just released yesterday, right? And uh, as part of Node 10, there is support for uh, async iteration for readable stream. So you oh. can pour a weight off a readable stream and that just works. It's that's, super that's wonderful. Now, yeah. do you know, do you guys know how they're going to, are they going to um, switch to the async, like the, those streams as like, is that, does that work with like symbol iterator? Is that how that works? Is there like on their, on the stream object, there's like a symbol iterator and that? There's a symbol of async iterator. So it's similar to the old iteration protocol, but there's a but new async. async iteration. Okay. It works in very much the same way. Just you returns a promise. A promise for each iteration, and then you can await the result of each promise before continuing with the, the next iteration. Also, okay. every, everything that has a symbol dot iterator can also be async iterated because it will the engine will automatically create a wrapper object for you then. Right. Oh, it will automatically like you can, you like can. like if you were doing a weight of a value that's not a promise that it right. just. It just yeah, acts as you if you, do that. you can just write await 42 and that, that will just work. Yeah, and that schedules on a new micro task. I know that's getting a little deep, but does that, is that actually, is that true? Like I actually never, i never thought about that, but does it actually schedule that? Like it wraps it essentially in a, in a promise and evaluates it that way? Oh, wow, yeah. cool. That's very cool. Um, in terms of other features, there's, uh, I mean, I like modules and I think it's really exciting to see where this is going because people are still figuring it out like on Node, for example. So mm. I can see what happens there. Uh, there's lots of other small features that have recently landed. Like uh, one proposal is numeric literal separators, where uh, whenever you use a uh, numeric literal, and it has lots of digits or lots of repeated digits, for example, it becomes hard to read for the human eye. So now you can add underscores at any position in that numeric literal to make it more readable. So th that's mm. a very small feature, but it makes your code more readable and more maintainable. And I, I like small improvements like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, Anything else? Private fields. We are getting private fields in, cl in classes and fields in general. That's, that's really cool as well. Oh, wonderful. Is, is the work already done for that? Is that something I can, you can play with today, or is that um, that's still in progress? Uh, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Public fields are done, yes. 
And I think they're also shipping already, or they should be shipping in Chrome 67. Uh, private fields is mostly done. And static fields are still up for discussion how this is going to work. So this is still in PC39. And decorators didn't move recently, so that's the main class feature that's coming. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure about those Chrome versions, but we can look it up at chromestatus.com. There's the definite uh, answer to this question. But either way, it's coming soon. Cool. Wonderful. Well, thank you three for, for joining us. Uh, I think it has been very helpful. And uh, if you guys want, we can have you guys back on um, here in you know a little while to, uh, to get, give another update if you guys have anything else later. Um, any, any, any last words? Write modern idiomatic JavaScript. That, that is the moral of this podcast. Boom. Just write normal JavaScript. Yeah. Yep. Well, great. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop <laughs> writing. I know. I know. It's so hard. It's so hard. Like, you, you get the stuff ingrained in you, right? Like, you, and you get inter you used to get interviewed on it. Like, I'd go to places that would interview, like, that would, uh, I would avoid those places as much as possible, obviously. But they would ask you just stupid questions. But uh, start reviewing your PRs now. So <laughs> please do, please do. No, I've, I've bugged Benedict plenty, of, uh, you know, several times about performance questions. So I've been, it's been very appreciative. But we're going to sign off. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining me again. I'm Jay Phelps. You can find me at underscore Jay Phelps, underscore J A Y P H E L P S uh, on Twitter. Um, the underscore is very important. Uh, where we, where can we find you guys on Twitter? Uh, so my Twitter handle is just my first name, Matthias with T and an H. You can also follow the entire V8 team uh, by following at V8JS. Yeah, the uh, JS is important, otherwise. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. is it the drink? Uh, juice. <laughs> it's a drink, yeah, fruit yeah, juice. That's the juice, I guess, yeah. That's the juice, yeah. Uh, we also just tweeted about this session as well, so you can find all of our Twitter IDs there in case you want to follow us. Cool. All right, guys. OK. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Take care. See you, everyone.